Psalm 119, I'd like to read verse 11 to 12, and uh, the title this morning of the message is The Importance of Knowing the Scriptures, The Importance of Knowing the Scriptures. Psalm 119, verse 11, it says, Your word I have hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. Well, we're continuing our series on the responsibilities of the local church, and so far we've seen the local church has the responsibility of equipping the saints, of submitting to one another, of worshiping together, taking care of each other, of having a lifestyle of love, and the responsibility of discipleship. Well, today we're going to look at the importance of the local church to know the scriptures, God's Word is one of His greatest gifts to us. Uh, personally, I consider it a treasure that He's blessed us with. For many years, uh, God's Word has brought peace and joy and comfort to those who are struggling. And uh, I've got several copies of the Bible in my possession, but there are a few that are very special to me. Uh, when I left for basic training, a, a gentleman from the Gideons came in and spoke to us, and he uh, told us he had some Bibles he wanted to give us, and... Uh, the first one I had, it was this desert camouflage uh, pocket New Testament. And I got some good use out of it while I was in basic training. And I sweat so much from the South Carolina heat in the summer. And so by the time basic training was over, that Bible was sweat soaked and dirty, but still very special to me. And then when I left for Iraq, the chaplain handed out uh, New Testaments to us. These ones had a ACU pattern on them, which was the the uniform um, that we were wearing. And so for 15 months, that Bible was in my pocket near my heart and it reminded me that God was with me, even in combat. Um, and that one definitely has some wear and tear on it and it's priceless to me. I hold it dear to my heart. Uh, when I was a kid, I remember telling my dad that I wanted to buy a, a Bible from CBD and he said, no, Bobby, you're not going to buy one. I'm going to get one for you. And so uh, the Bible you bought for me, I still have that today. It's an old Schofield reference Bible, and that holds a special place in my heart. And then when I got ordained here at Bering, the church bought me a MacArthur Study Bible. It has my name on it and reminds me of how special this church is to me. So that Bible holds a special place in my heart. And then when my dad moved to Florida, he gave me his Bible that he preached from for many years and has his notes in it, has some of his sermon notes, and so that one holds a special place in my heart. So, so I've got all these um, Bibles, all these Bibles that are precious to me. But when you really think about it, uh, those Bibles that I hold are just books. You know, there, there's billions of Bibles that have been printed and that are all over the world. More people have access to the Bible than ever before. That's great news, and we should continue to make physical copies of the Bible available to anyone who wants one. But there's something even more important than having a physical copy of the Bible, and that's having God's Word in our hearts. And here at our church, we uh, need to always hold it close, never push it aside and stop using it. We need to learn from it and memorize it and apply it as we come to a, a greater knowledge through it, a knowledge of God. So let's look this morning at why it's important for our church to know the scriptures. Well, first of all, God's word is precious. Here in Psalm 119, the first part of verse 11 says, Your word I have hidden in my heart. Well, as Christians, we have the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And so over time, the more you read God's word, the more of it we memorize and the more it becomes a part of our everyday lives. Uh, I remember when I brought my Bible to basic tra uh, training, we had a, a drill sergeant that he told us to all be quiet and put our heads down. And so I did, but I also um, took my pocket New Testament and put it up to my face as, so I could read it, you know, up close. And, uh, and, and so then the drill sergeant figured out what I was doing and started to make fun of me, and then he took the Bible from me. So... It was embarrassing, but I was able to remember what I was reading and was able to hide it in my heart so that I could continue thinking about it. I believe that day that we were out on the grenade range, so it was uh, good to have God's word in my heart on that day because that was throwing grenades, blowing things up 
can get kind of scary. Um, well, for us here at Bering Baptist Church, we need to have God's word hidden in our hearts because it's precious and it's so important. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Well, the word richly there means largely, plentifully, in, the, in an abundant manner, abundantly. So you know how when we look at gold or diamonds or crystals, uh, any other kind of precious stones, we see how beautiful it is. And, uh, you know, it's mesmerizing as you look at it. And those who own these things consider it, um, them to be treasure and can get quite expensive to, to own them. So they hold them close, they're very valuable. Well, God's word is so much more valuable than this world's treasures. Uh, that's why it says to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, to sing them with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Well, psalms there, you know, the book of psalms here includes poetry and songs, and poetry and songs are an easy way to memorize. And, of course, the, the types of songs that we need to be singing in church are hymns, hymns and spiritual songs. And then when we sing these songs, it's great because these songs use Scripture, make us think of Scripture. For example, when we sing the song, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever, we're singing Psalm 89, verse 1. When we sing the chorus of faith is the victory, we're singing 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Those are just a couple of examples, but when we sing those songs, since we are singing scripture, it's important that we not just say the words. You know, we need to be singing them with our hearts because that's the same as hiding God's word in our hearts. Because, you know, God's word is only valuable if we truly understand and love it for what it is. You know, it, it's not just a textbook or a list of rules to follow. I know there are people that think that, uh, but it is God's words directly to us. But I'd like to point something important out. Just like we would protect a physical treasure, we also need to protect God's word. You know, there, by that I mean there's a lot of forgeries out there right now. There are those who quote God's word but not for what it really means. You know, they, they fit it to, uh, they change it to fit their own interpretations. For example, the scripture, do not judge. You hear that all the time. It's used to justify sin in the lives of others. God says, do not judge. So we shouldn't be saying that that person is a sinner for being a homosexual or for being transgender or for cheating on or divorcing their spouse because they're just not happy anymore. Don't judge. Well, those are just a few examples, but that's what we're always told when we use scripture to point out sin in our world. Don't judge. Unfortunately, many churches have fallen into the trap of listening to that lie, among others, uh, and actually says, don't judge, but to judge with uh, righteous judgment which isn't a looking down upon you, it's calling out sin for what it is, but doing it with love uh, and compassion, not with hate or looking down on somebody. But we are told to, to judge with righteous judgment, um, pointing out what's true. Um, now, those lies out there, that's why we have so many denominations out there that no longer believe the Bible is without error or completely and fully God's word. But the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of truth. So you see, there's a, there's a wrong way to handle God's word. And that's by handling it according to what our, cultures, to what our culture says. You know, the, the Bible's too hateful, so let's make it less hateful by changing it or you know uh, God didn't really say it say that in, in the Bible that was added by a bigot 
A lot of people call the Apostle Paul a bigot, and he wrote most of the New Testament. Or uh, a church is a bunch of hypocrites, and they don't really know what the Bible says. Um, well, brothers and sisters, God's Word is precious. It is perfect as it is, and you and I must protect it in its entirety. And that's why here at Bering Baptist Church, I'll always have a Bible up here at the pulpit, and we'll preach from it. And if there ever comes a day when uh, I stop using the Bible, then at that point you need to fire me because this church needs to always stand on God's Word. And without it, we might as well just be a social club that gets together for, for fun and, and not to grow in a relationship with the Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 says, Preach the Word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, Exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Well, as you can see, God clearly gives the purpose of God's word uh, faithfully being proclaimed from the pulpit to convince, to rebuke, to exhort with all long suffering and teaching. You know, it shouldn't just be Pastor Bobby up here telling you what to do, uh, it needs to be the Holy Spirit through God's Word. And one final thing I'll add before we move on to the next point. Uh, one day, our physical copies of the Bible might be taken away from us. It's already happened in other parts of the world, a lot of countries where they burn Bibles. And if that were to happen, I'd ask, would you have God's Word hidden in your heart so that even without a physical copy of the Bible, his word would still be there in your heart and would still be just as precious as it is now. I encourage you to memorize scripture, hide it in your heart, so that even if the Bible was taken away from us, we would still have it in our hearts and our minds. Second, God's word combats sin. God's word combats sin. Here in Psalm 119, verse 11, um, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Well, sin and temptation is all around us, and sometimes it can be overwhelming, especially when the world starts to accept things that God says are sin. But the more that we read God's word, the more we realize that just because man says something is okay, doesn't mean that God is okay with it. So when we're tempted to sin, the Holy Spirit brings Scripture to our minds, warning us not to give in to that temptation. And the more that we read His Word, the easier it becomes to resist temptation. It's always a struggle, but with His Word hidden in our hearts, the Holy Spirit gives us the strength to resist. If we're not resisting and we're giving in, then we have to ask ourselves, is his word truly hidden in my heart? And if it's not, then you're opening the door for temptation, sin to come in. And if you're not careful, that sin, that temptation will destroy you. I love the fact that when Satan attempted uh, to tempt Jesus out in the wilderness, our Lord simply quoted scripture right back to him. And that's what we should be doing as well, quoting scripture having it in our hearts and our minds. Unfortunately, there are a lot of false teachers out there who have led uh, people to sin because they changed God's word. Uh, turn with me to Galatians chapter 1. Keep your place in Psalm 119 and turn over to the New Testament to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, starting at verse 6, it says, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we've preached to you, let it be accursed. 
As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you've received, let him be accursed. Uh, turn over to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. I'd like to read verse 1 to 3. Peter chapter 2 verse 1 it says there were also false prophets among the people even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction and many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed by covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 to 5, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 to 5. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. It says, The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they'll turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. Well, as you can see, the Apostle Paul knew that during his time and in the future, people would stop learning and understanding or believing Scripture. And instead of having Scripture in their hearts, they would instead choose to listen to teachers who would tell them what they wanted to hear. Uh, some examples of these false teachers are those who go up and just give a motivational speech to lift people up instead of sermons that lift God up. For those who are people pleasers, uh, teaching the people can live however they want to live. God's okay with it, he understands, and you can live however you want. And then there are those who teach there's other ways to get to heaven, or that you have to do good works to get to heaven. False teachers put their false, dangerous teachings uh, on vulnerable people. They teach it to vulnerable people who don't know the Bible or don't just don't care what the Bible says. Um, and we see a lot of that, actually thinking of it this month because of uh, LGBT Pride Month, and I've read a lot of pastors or people who say they're pastors or theologians who are uh, justifying it and saying, you know, God is understanding and this, that, and the other, and and just dissecting the Bible to take out what they want and leaving out the parts that are truth. And it's sad. Uh, it's dangerous. It's important for us to understand that this is happening in churches and to people all over the world and not allow that to creep into our church. How could it creep in here? Well, there are a lot of supposedly Christian books out there being read, and being written. I'll use one that I've read as an example. It was titled, Love Wins, and it was written by a popular preacher named Rob Bell. And in that book, he wrote about why he didn't believe that a loving God would send unbelievers to hell. And so he believed that either hell doesn't exist, or that God doesn't send people there. And his conclusion was that in the end, love wins. As in, God won't send anyone to hell if there is a hell. So you can imagine if after I read that book, I then came up here and started teaching you that heresy or encouraging you to read that book. Well, would that be, excuse me, that would be the spirit of deception. That would be coming through a false teaching from a false teacher 
And if it was allowed in our church, we would lose God's blessing because then I would be a false teacher and it'd become a spiritually dead church. Going against God's truth, going against God's word and what he truly says. That's, that's just one example, but there are so many false teachings out there. So we need to guard ourselves against that in church um, and individually as believers. We, we need to use God's word to combat the sin of false teaching by hiding his word in our hearts. Lastly, we see God's word is from God. He's given it to us, his word. Verse 12, Psalm 119, uh, it says, Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. Well, God's word is the greatest book that's ever been written. And the statistics say that it's actually the most sold book of all time. Uh, it doesn't mean that people read it. Uh, a lot of people put it on their shelves uh, and it collects dust. But it is the most popular book uh, that's been sold over the years. Hebrews, it's how God communicates with us. Hebrews 4.12 says, The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. God's word is a gift to us. It speaks to us. It draws us closer to God. It helps us to love him more as we come to learn and know the scriptures more and more. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. By the way, I mentioned earlier about songs to remember our scripture. That is a song. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That's obviously important since we live in a dark world full of sin. We need God's light through his word. And it's the Holy Spirit who speaks to us through it and helps us to understand it. Unfortunately, there are lying, false spirits that the enemy uses to deceive people with false doctrine. And as we saw in the last point, false teachers. Those teachings from deceptive spirits are not from God. And they're very dangerous. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 to 3 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you've heard was coming, and is now already in the world. Those who make Jesus something else than what Scripture says he truly is, the Son of God, who's come into the world to forgive our sin. So we need to be very careful. The enemy loves to imitate the works of God. And that's what he does with his word. There are versions of the Bible out there that give God a feminine name. I so just saw one yesterday that I did not know was out there. It's called the Queen James Bible. <laughs> the Queen James Bible. And it takes out all references to God as uh, he, any male references to him. Uh, and there's other versions out there that are specifically um, geared towards the LGBT lifestyle. Versions out there that take out the divinity of Jesus completely. And completely change the word of God and the truth of God and make it into a lie. And there are teachers who are teaching deceptive doctrines that are destroying teacher, uh, destroying churches, destroying in, the individual lives of believers as well, or those seeking the truth. Um, so we need to be testing the spirits, making sure that they are truly from God. But how do we know? Well, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17 to 18 says, Beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. And then it says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, so the only way to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is to always actively be seeking him. It starts here in the local church as I teach you through the Holy Spirit 
and we learn together with the Holy Spirit here with us. God leads me to preach certain sermons, and he uses them to teach you and to help you, to teach me and help me, of course. But it's not supposed to stop there. You're supposed to take what you learn, and I'm supposed to take what I learn, and to keep learning as we go home. You know, we, we don't just want to come and listen to the sermon, or me to write it, and then leave here and forget all about it. That's what the enemy wants. He wants us to be a Sunday morning Christian, and then that's it. You know, God understands you're busy throughout the week, and... He's pleased with you at least going on Sundays. That's enough time with God. Just one hour a week. No, God wants you to go home and to keep studying His Word throughout the week. It's not supposed to be a chore. It's a special time of communion between you and Him. For different people, that looks differently. Uh, some people listen to sermons on the radio. Some people um, will uh, read devotionals. Uh, as long as you are receiving God's word throughout the week and communicating with him, thinking about him, speaking to him through prayer, you know, you are doing what you're supposed to do, um, keeping that relationship with the Lord, keeping special communion. Uh, and the things that he teaches us personally, individually, according to our own circumstances, those things he teaches us are amazing and wonderful, and it shows us just how much the Lord loves us. And if uh, you're in a close relationship with the Lord, He will protect you from deceptive spirits and false and confusing teachings. You know, you, you might hear something on the TV or radio from a preacher and think, you know, that, that just doesn't sound right. You know, something like maybe uh, if you're walking with God and you have faith, you're not ever going to have any problems. You're not going to get sick. You won't be in debt. God's not going to let that happen to you. Or maybe, you know, something like, uh, it's okay to do that sin, God understands and he'll forgive you. It won't control you, you're strong enough to deal with it on your own, just continue in that sin. You know, the Holy Spirit, when you hear something that doesn't sound right in, in Scripture, or someone teaching Scripture, or you get that uneasy feeling, something isn't right. So then you go to Scripture... And he shows you why that isn't true and what actually is true. We need to remember that just because a preacher gets up in the pulpit and says it, just because a person has reverend or doctor or the uh, very, what is it, very honored reverend, whatever, you know, just because they have all these titles before their name doesn't make what they're saying true. There's actually a story in the Old Testament about the wicked king Ahab, and he's going out to battle against the Syrian army. And he had an alliance with King Jehoshaphat, who was a godly king. And before they went out to battle, Jehoshaphat wanted to hear from a prophet of the Lord if God would be with them and give them victory or not. So the Bible says that God actually sent a lying spirit. And that these prophets all told King Ahab that he was going to have victory. These were prophets who claimed to be telling him the words of God. God is going to be with you. God is going to give you the victory. But that lying spirit was not telling the truth. And in that instance, God sent a lying spirit um, because Ahab was going to be judged for his wickedness. He had led Israel completely astray from God had them worshiping all sorts of false idols, had committed murder. He was a very wicked man. So God sent this lying spirit to make him think that he would be successful in battle, and he actually was killed in that battle. So in that case, the kings listened to the lying spirit, and Ahab was killed. And uh, you see, there's lying spirits out there, the <coughs> lying spirits that are from the enemy, not from God. You know, in that case, God allow the lying spirit to go out to, to be used for his, for his purposes. But there are lying spirits out there that the enemy uses that he wants us to listen to them so that we'll then stray from our walk with the Lord. But when we take the responsibility of knowing the scriptures seriously, God will bless us and he will protect us and he'll keep us on the right track. He'll keep us filled with his truth. So brothers and sisters, our church family 
here and bearing must always keep scripture and the knowledge of scripture at the forefront of our hearts and minds. God's word. God's word is precious. It will help us to combat sin and it will keep us protected from false teaching and lying spirits. May we always work to honor and please God in all we do as a church family. In closing, I'd like to address anyone watching on the video who does not have a relationship with <coughs> Jesus. I want you to know God loves you so much that he came to the world, Jesus, and gave his life on the cross for the sin of the world. So that any person who believes <coughs> in him will not perish in hell, but will be with Jesus forever in heaven. And what a blessed time that's going to be to have a relationship with him for all of eternity. If you haven't made that decision to have a relationship with him, I encourage you to do so today. It's the best decision you'll ever make, and uh, I encourage you to do so. Let us close in prayer. We love you so much, Almighty God. We thank you for your word that you've given to us. May we hide your word in our hearts, learning it, loving it, continuing to grow in our knowledge of you through it. May your spirit draw us closer and closer and continuously speak to us through it. Lord, we want to walk in your truth, not in error. We don't want to be driven away by false teachings, false doctrines, lying spirits Let it, that will lead us astray from you. No, we want your truth, Lord. May we always be faithful to you as, our, as a church. May we be grounded in you and in your truth and your word. We love you so much. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.